Well, thank you very much. I think the first time I came here, some of you were still a twinkle in your mother's eye. But uh, um, it's nice to be back. Uh, it's some years since I was here. The, the topic I was given today is, is an interesting one. What to do when autonomy clashes with doing no harm. There are lots of clashes and they're going to increase. Perhaps the easiest way to give you a sense of how this works is to tell you a, a brief true story of something that happened to me some years ago, which shows you what you might be running into. I saw a little girl who had a neglected septic knee. By the time she got to me, the knee was destroyed, there was pus in the, te uh, the femur and pus in the tibia, and she was dying of septicemia. Given where we were, the only thing that we could do to save her life was to cut off her leg and get the pus out and fill her with what antibiotics we had. This was not in North America or Europe. Um, so I told the parents that that was the only option that was open to them. And they said, well, we need to think about that. And I said, well, the OR will be ready in 20 minutes. During those 20 minutes, they took her home, where she undoubtedly died. And I was the only person who was upset. The missionary surgeon who would have done the operation was very busy and he went on to the next case. I had done pediatric rounds that morning and the nurses were there and they were not upset. And I said, may I talk to you? And they said, yes. Fortunately, I asked the right question. I said, what would those parents have done if this had been a little boy? And they said, oh, they would have done the amputation. I said, why would you treat little boys and little girls differently? And they said, in our culture, it is a woman's job to till the fields, fetch the water, cook the food, and bear the children. A woman with one leg cannot do those things, so she will have a life not worth living. So in that case, there was no autonomy at all, and the choice of what doing no harm was was very different from what ours would be. That's the world we live in. Now, it's one thing to meet different views on different continents, but increasingly, you're going to meet them in your own practice. We are no longer, in the Western world, nations. A nation cannot be held together by difference. It can only be held together by what it holds in common. And the amount that we hold together in common is diminishing day by day. And you will have to deal with that. It's showing up very strongly in conscience rights. Well, when it comes to moral feelings, people have non-commensurable ideas. There is no fudge way out of it. There is no compromise. Moral neutrality is mentioned, but of course that's a, a ridiculous concept. It doesn't exist. You only have to ask one question. Why ought I to be morally neutral? And the only way you can answer that is by pr proposing some form of moral position. Because you have to say, because you ought to for this or that reason. People who talk about moral neutrality are usually wanting to take an old and well-tried system and replace it with a modern one that hasn't been tested. Not a smart move. When I went to medical school, there were no lectures in ethics. It wasn't that we were more ethical, but we didn't have arguments about what ethics were. People knew they were doing things that were not right, but they didn't bother to try and defend it. That was America when you started. De Tocqueville, when he came here, realized that that was the great gift that America had, that the government could get on with doing things that governments on occasion might get right, like building roads and bridges and things like that. They didn't have to persuade people as to the nature of good and evil. There was agreement. You see that in the old cowboy movies. To make quite sure you understood that the good guy wore a white hat and the bad guy wore a black hat. And when the guy with the black hat was caught, he didn't say, my mother beat me and tried to put the blame on somebody else. He said, well, I've lived a bad life. I deserve what I'm getting. That was a world in which there was moral cohesion. Uh, now that doesn't exist. And that's what you've got to deal with. So the liberal, really, I would say hubris, was to start ethics courses. Um, when we started ethics courses in our university in Ottawa some 20 odd years ago, uh, I was not asked to take part, uh, being too much of a maverick I suppose in some ways, um, but the dean at the time was a very nice liberal gentleman who did palliative care and I met him at a cocktail party and I said to him, it's nice to see you're teaching 
the student's uh, ethics. What do you expect to get from that? And he said, well, more ethical behavior. I said, that's highly unlikely. Ethics courses may turn you into an amateur ethicist, but they certainly won't make you ethical. The problem is not at that level. Easy to demonstrate. Raise your hand if you are good. <laughs> Some people went that far and came down. Uh, I remember the first time I did this with professors at Harvard, and nobody moved there. Uh, I took them by surprise. And I said, now you've embarrassed me. I expected the clever postmodern response would be, I don't understand your question. <laughs> that would be a Bill Clinton response. But they did understand my question. And so by not raising their hand, they told me two things straight away. They told me, A, that they had no difficulty with defining good and evil. And secondly, they told me they were not doing what was good. That's an interesting situation, isn't it? But it makes it very clear that ethics is not a problem the university can solve because it's not a problem of ignorance. It's a problem of the will. I suspect that you, like me, have great difficulty in doing what you know to be right on many occasions. Now, when you have children, they will point it out to you. Uh, I have children and 21 grandchildren, so I get it pointed out fairly regularly. <laughs> But that's where the problem lies. Now, the way that we get it wrong most often is by disordering things that are good. The things that we all know. If you're interested, the book to read, which is readable, uh, unlike many textbooks, it's not a textbook in fact, although it's written by a professor, it's a book by a man called Budyshevsky from the University of Texas at Austin. It has a lovely title that your English teacher in high school would put a red mic through because it's a double negative. It's what we can't not know. It's rather a nice title really. Because all of us know a lot more than we admit. Our society in fact in the Western world is the first one in the history of the world to try to live by denying that it knows what it does know. It's a very unusual thing to happen historically but it's what's happening. We know much more than we want to admit to. Everybody, for instance, knows that it is wrong to do gratuitous harm to an innocent human being, right? There's no one anywhere in the world who will stand up in public and say, that's okay. So they have to rationalize in various ways by redefining human being or re redefining innocent or redefining something. That's the way they get around it. But in so doing, navigating that society becomes more and more difficult. Now most of you, when you finish medical school, sadly will be landed with the Georgetown mantra as about the sum total of your ethical knowledge. Autonomy, justice, beneficence and non-maleficence. Think about those four categories and you've done your job. Sadly, not true. Um, but first of all, you're very, very unlikely to have anyone discuss with you, are those a smorgasbord laid out in an egalitarian fashion, each equally valuable? Or is there some connection between them that you need to see for it to work well? And of course it's the latter. They are not equal. Many of you, particularly of the younger generation, are being taught that your choice is all that matters. That's a very dangerous way to go. One stands on the other. Let me show you how it works. The most fundamental one of all, the Jews will teach you, is thou shalt not. When a society has a range of things which it will not tolerate, interesting isn't it, I'm now proposing intolerance as an important virtue. Well it is. And when a society has a range of things that it will not tolerate, then there's some possibility that you can live knowing what's going to happen in many situations. Let me illustrate. A few years ago now, in your, more than your lifetime in many years ago, about 20 years ago, uh, I was asked to give a talk to a Mennonite community in the Canadian prairies. Now, it was way out in the sticks. Uh, I got there in spring, but it was still snowing. Um, and the guy who picked me up in Winnipeg said, it's all right, there won't be anything on the road today as we drove at about 100 kilometers an hour through a snowstorm. Um, but we got there. Um, and being a real community, a lot of them turn out, unlike universities where Nobel Prize winners sometimes get audiences of 20. 
But in a village of 1,500 people, 500 turned up to the lecture. That's a community. Um, I can't remember what I talked about. It was a fundraiser, but I went on too long, which is not rare for me. Watch the clock. Um, and when I'd finished, it was too late to go back to Winnipeg that night. So the doc who'd invited me said, you better stay with me. And we drove to his house in his nice car. Uh, he drove into the garage. He didn't lock the car. He didn't lock the garage. He left the ignition key in the car. We went into the house, and he said, your room's at the top of the stairs. Um, and he didn't lock the door. And he said, do you need anything tonight? It's late. I said, no, I couldn't resist. Isn't leaving the ignition key in the car a trifle careless? And he shrugged and said, oh, you never know who may need it. <laughs> that is true freedom, isn't it? And he could do that because in that community for the last hundred years, they have been teaching in school, and they don't listen to the government, and the government's smart enough not to interfere, that thou shalt not steal is not an imposition, but a description of who we are. They teach it at home, in church, and in school. The result is they don't have a locksmith, because they don't need one. When people go on holiday in that village, they don't lock the door, because somebody might need something, and then they'd have to break a window to get it. That's stupid. That is also freedom, real freedom. Without a framework of law, real freedom cannot exist. Many of you have been taught that freedom is defined as freedom from interference. But freedom from is a very diminished freedom. The best freedom is the freedom to be able to do what you ought. For which, if you are able to do it, you've probably got to thank your parents. Uh, Truth-telling was imprinted on my backside, very young, by my mother. Uh, and one of the papers I published should actually have her name on it, because without her, it wouldn't have happened. And it has saved thousands of lives. Because as an academic, I just wanted publications. And the outliers could have been lost with the five devia standard deviation law. But she had imprinted on my mind and my backside that you ought to pursue things to find out what they're really about. So I dug out the notes of those children and they'd all died. And the end result was that I had the privilege of putting the last piece into the puzzle of treating severely malnourished children, which was refeeding deaths. Without that training when I was this high, I would have taken the publication to add to my curriculum vanitas. Not the way to live. So Moses tells the children of Israel when they get started in the world's greatest commencement address, which is Deuteronomy, he says, the greatest thing you have is the law. He's very politically incorrect. He says, all the nations around you will recognize that your law is better than theirs. No multiculturalism for Moses. And he says, add to that the fact that you will neglect it. And they did, of course. Knowing is not the problem. Doing is the problem. Many of you haven't been in medical school very long, but I know I can say this to you with perfect impunity. Within two months of starting medical school, there were a considerable number of people in your class about whom you'd already decided you would never trust the care of a dog of yours to them, right? I can see from your faces that the answer is yes. I had an email from one of the students who took the course at Augustine, that she'll be a nameless American medical school, because I normally say it's about 20% of the class these days. And he said, you've got to change your numbers. In my class this year, it's 50% of the class I don't trust. And I've been in other parts of the world where a young woman in the front row, in one country that shall be nameless, when I asked this question, said, I don't trust anyone in this medical school. Under those circumstances, you cannot practice medicine because nobody knows everything. You need a referral practice and you need to trust the people you refer to. We are in trouble. Now, we know what we ought not to do, but we find ourselves doing it. But at least when you have those negatives in place, you can extrapolate to the positives. The physical world, the physical cosmos may be enlarging, but the moral one is not. Throughout human history, truth and falsehood, honor, dishonor, love, hatred have existed. And certainly you know very well that fidelity and infidelity are real things, aren't they? 
because you, unlike my generation, have suffered from divorce. And no child has ever enjoyed it, have they? Because it is an affront to the fidelity that children come into the world hardwired to expect. They are not innocent little bundles of uh, powerless flesh, are they? They can get you out of bed at a moment's notice and driving hell for leather down to the nearest hospital, whenever they wish. <laughs> they have immense power. I watch it all the while with all my grandchildren. No, it's not made that, the world is not made that way. So, but those goods are known to us, sadly, often simply by a logical process rather than by their experience. Uh, when you see the experience, it's beautiful, isn't it? But we reduce things. Sex in the modern world is not love. Because the sex that happens within love cannot be portrayed directly. It's missed the point entirely. Let me illustrate what I mean, again, from a patient many years ago. When I was a bit older than some of you, uh, two or three years into the practice of medicine, I was at the National Heart Hospital in London, and I had often passed the newspaper seller at the entrance to Bond Street uh, tube station, uh, an old cockney. And then he turned up as a patient. And he was in heart failure in the days when Dad didn't have a good prognosis. Uh, I tucked him up and started him off on what treatment we had. A little later that evening I went in and there his wife was sitting next to him holding his hand and they were both in tears. And I said, what's the matter? And they, she said, we have slept together every night for 50 years. That's love, isn't it? They were in tears about that thought. That's deeper than we've managed nowadays, which is all external. So you, we know what we ought not to do, we do it. We know what we ought to do, we frequently fail. But those are nevertheless still the framework for a society. Only on that basis can you get to justice. You all want justice, but think about it for a minute. Fortunately for me, the person who does the best job with this is a man called Arthur Leff. He's dead now, but as far as I can discover, he was an unbelieving Jew who taught common law at Yale in the 1970s. And he was looking at his law students way back then, and he was not happy at the thought that they were going to be powerful. And so he gave a lecture at Duke on his philosophy of justice. It's so good that I have the first paragraph paraphrased in my head. He goes like this, he says, I want to believe, and so do you, in a complete eminence, that means accessible to you, a technical term, and transcendent set of propositions about right and wrong. Findable rules that direct us as to how to live our lives righteously. Now he's a Jew, he wants Torah to be from God. Because he's a lawyer. And he knows if there is no authority above the judge, in a Darwinian world, why wouldn't the judge do what advances his gene pool over yours? There is no reason. He knew that. That's why they are truly our robed masters at the moment. The case in Canada is worse than the US. At least you have judges who know that this is an issue. In Canada, they don't even know that this is an issue. He goes on, however, to say this, but I also want to believe, and so do you, in no such thing as a transcendent law, but rather that we are wholly free to decide for ourselves what we ought to do and what we ought to be. What we want, heaven help us, is to be simultaneously perfectly ruled and perfectly free. That is, at the same time, to discover the right and the good and to invent it. Even Americans can't have both. Which one are you choosing? At the moment, you're going very definitely in the direction of your choice being top of the list. Very, very dangerous thing to do. Time to repent. Now, Left does something very unprofessorial next. He writes 20 pages of lucid prose. You can understand what he's saying. Uh, he's not playing silly sociological games with uh, a vocabulary that only three people in the world understand. No, he's not doing that. But at the end of the lecture, the last two paragraphs are stunning. He's at Yale in the 1970s. Social Darwinianism is dominant. He can't bring himself to buck the trend, to be out of step. But he is still honest. So he says, it looks to me as though we are all that we have. 
<coughs> the result of a colossal accident. Darwin's world. But he says, looking around the world, this is an extraordinarily unappetizing prospect. If brotherly love exists, the ruling model appears to be Cain and Abel. Nowadays in many universities, I hope not in the prairies or in the Midwest, I have to explain who Cain and Abel are or were because there are a good many students who don't know. They are bereft of metaphors as a result. That's astonishing. He said, only if the law was unnatural and unspeakable by us would it be unchallengeable. As things stand now, everything is up for grabs. He's the first academic lawyer I know of to point out that following Roe v. Wade, the law had become the pursuit of power, not the pursuit of justice. And in fact, three sub-faculties in the university frankly teach that. Black studies teach it, women's studies teach it, and homosexual studies teach that the law is about power, not about justice. That's a very sad state of affairs. Now, Leff can't actually bear his own conclusion. So he writes two more sentences, totally negating what he's just said. And not surprisingly, he never again in his life attempted a lecture on the philosophy of justice. But he says this, nevertheless, Napalming babies is wicked. Starving the poor is wrong. Buying and selling each other is depraved. There is in this world such a thing as evil. He just said there wasn't. Now he knew what he ought to do. He was well trained. If you have a technically solid argument and you arrive at an unsustainable conclusion, what must you do? Re-examine the premise. He should have gone back and said, because we know that not harming babies is wicked, buying and selling each other is depraved, because we know these things, it looks to me as though we cannot be all that we have, because we can't get to that position from, that, from the other one. There is no morality in our sense amongst animals. I live on a farm, I raise cows, beef, to sell at vast profit to Americans. Um, especially as your cows have all died of drought this year, the price is going to triple this year probably. Uh, but there is no order except power as to who feeds first and who leads the way. It's, that's the way it is. Fortunately for me, the guy who got it right first was none other, in my view anyway, than one of Harvard's favourite sons, Robert Frost. I hadn't I used this poem for years from when I was a child, when I was giving a talk of this sort in Harvard. And I got to this point, I thought, I'm in enough trouble already, I don't need to make it worse, but I couldn't resist. Because the animal rights movement is built into this. When we lose the sense of who we are and the, the differences, we, we have trouble. And Frost saw it coming. And it's in a poem called The White-Tailed Hornet. He, like me, lived on a farm, and hornets are part of the deal. They're fascinating insects, and he was fascinated by them. He'd go and watch them every year. That particular year, he'd got a bit too close, got stung. That's the first part of the poem. But then, a little later, he's found his distance, and he's watching, and a hornet attacks a nail three or four times before its reflexes kick in, and he realizes this is a waste of time. And then he goes back and he writes this. He said, won't this instinct matter bear revision? Won't almost any theory bear revision? To err is human, not to animal. Or so we pay the compliment to instinct that really takes away instead of gives. Our humour, conscientiousness and worship went long since to the dogs under the table and served us right for having instituted downward comparisons. As long on earth as our comparisons were stoutly upwards, with gods and angels we were men at least. But once our comparisons were yielded downwards into the mud and even dust, t'was disillusion upon disillusion. We were lost piecemeal to the animals, like people thrown out to delay the walls. Only our fallibility was left us, and this day's work makes even that seem doubtful. He's nailed it. That's the problem. That's why ethics lectures won't make you ethical. That's why there are not going to be easy solutions to the problem how, how one person's view of their choice versus your choice is going to be worked out. It's problematic. 
During the Second World War, Dutch physicians preferred to be sent to a concentration camp rather than kill disabled children or adults. That's what happened. They beat Hitler because he needed the Dutch doctors to look after his army. So Holland was one of the few countries in the Third Reich that actually had some disabled people at the end of the Second World War. A couple of generations later, Holland becomes the first country in the world to kill patients. And just a few years ago, they published in the New England Journal of Medicine a protocol for killing patients, children, in no immediate danger of death because they were judged by the physician to be having a life not worthy to be lived, which is the phrase the Germans used. Most of those children had spina bifida. If you ask children with spina bifida, they say, I'm glad I'm alive. Where's autonomy there? It's the autonomy of the doctor that's dominated the non-existent autonomy of the baby. But that world will be a different world. It will be harsher. Your job is to bring some gentleness into that situation if you can. Now, during my lifetime, I have been very much blessed by patients that came my way. The last clinic I ran bef I, before I retired from pediatrics was for se severely disabled children. I often used to wonder at the end of that clinic who the patient was. More often it was me rather than them. We need more disabled children if the world is to be civilised, not less. Let me illustrate. One of the things, because of my interest in malnutrition, I discovered, I went back to what I'd been taught. When I was a student, children with severe quadriplegic cerebral palsy were expected to be cold in summer. They were actually malnourished. The quality of their skin was good because the quality of their diet was okay. They just couldn't get enough in. And I was pushed to go and see a patient in the children's hospital by an orthopedic surgeon who'd been questioning me about what I'd done in Jamaica. And he said, I've got a patient you might like to see. And I went to see her and she was technically malnourished. I'd never thought about this before. When I did a search, I couldn't believe it. There was no literature. There was no attempt even to, to measure the efficiency of the feeding of quadriplegic children. It turns out it's about 10% of normal. Now, if you could only feed with 10% efficiency, you'd need 10 hours a day to get your calories in. That's not affordable by any health system. So they necessarily became malnourished. But because they were otherwise well looked after, they lived a long while. I went looking and I found 20 teenagers weighing less than 40 pounds. No neglect. The people were trying hard. You couldn't do better than that. So I started putting permanent feeding tubes in. Now to say to a mum who's had one of these children with a high CP so that the swallowing mechanism is involved, that she can't even feed this child who will never walk or talk, that's very hard to take. So it took most mums about two years to get there. But almost the last one that I put a tube into, before we got to the modern version, we had to put a Foley in first and I'd put the button in in outpatients. So I was gonna put the button in and mum was there with this Little, little baby, who's only six months old. She got there very quickly. And I said, is, this is going to hurt and there's no way I can avoid that, but it will be quick. Do you want to go out to the clinic while I put it in and come back? And she said, no, I know what you're going to do. I'll hold his hand, I won't interfere, and I'll comfort him afterwards. So I put it in and he yelped, and she calmed him down. And then I said to her, do you mind asking some questions for me? Because you're way ahead of the curve. I want to know how you got here so quickly. And she looked at me as though I needed remedial help, which I did. And she said, well, I married young and my family had all grown up and left. I was very lonely. The emptiness was not good for me. So God gave me a baby who will never grow up. And then she told me how this child is civilizing a whole rather depressed neighborhood in Ottawa with lots of single mums and latchkey kids. Now there's a little guy on the box who's fed through a button on his belly with a syringe. They used to come home and let themselves in and watch goodness knows what. Now they come to her because they all want to try. So this little guy who will never walk or talk 
is civilizing a whole neighborhood. And his mother is teaching them they don't need those rather ugly words they use too often. That's not a bad contribution to society, is it? The medievals knew that. They said of the mentally disabled that they are closer to God than the rest of us because they don't carry a grudge into tomorrow. We need Down syndrome children. They civilize the world. They do not carry grudges into tomorrow. Not many of us can say that, can we? Wouldn't your class be wonderful if everybody came tomorrow without a single grudge? Wouldn't this university be a different place? We need to start valuing what is truly valuable. And if you want to read about this more deeply, I would suggest you start with Wendell Berry's lovely little book, Life is a Miracle. You could also read one of his other books, Fidelity, to have a deconstruction of the more intensive and careful units you'll have to deal with later. Wendell Berry is about my age, a year or two older actually, a very great writer. He'd have a Nobel Prize if he wrote more politically respectable uh, material. Um, but in Life is a Miracle, he begins with a meditation on a subset of King Lear, a subplot in King Lear, which is where the phrase Life is a Miracle comes from. It's beautiful. And he totally deconstructs E.O. Wilson in the process. In the book Fidelity, there is a lovely story that every medical class should read about the problems with intensive care done in a beautiful way. And I won't spoil the book for you. You can get it on Amazon for next to nothing, I'm sure. So read Wendell Berry, Life is a Miracle and Fidelity. And then you'll begin to realize that ethics as such cannot be taught in the university. They are taught in the context of loving families. I grew up in a blue collar environment in Birmingham, in England, the British equivalent of Detroit. I doubt there was a man on the street who could define ethics. But all the young tykes on the street in my time knew what ethics were because their father would put it in their, into their backside with a boot or with a belt if they misbehaved. We didn't need the police. Nowadays, those men are intimidated into silence by sociologists and the like. It's not an improvement. So go away and think about what I've said. If you want to, you don't have to. Those of you who need to go, and I know some of you do, medical students are thrown out five minutes late and others have to go 10 minutes early, but that's the university. We used to have two hours for lunch. It was much better. <laughs> but if there are any questions, I'd be glad to try and answer them. Thank you. Yes, sir. Recently, and certainly, um, physician-assisted suicide will be an ethical issue oh, throughout the nation and in Minnesota. Yep. We assume. Yes. And in, in talking about your title, "Do No Harm," yes. Versus personal yes. autonomy. Um, and euthanasia. Well, there's a recent article in JAMA that suggested yeah. that "Do No Harm" should be redefined. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yep. Well, of course, the harm. Uh, the, the question is. In the modern world where physician-assisted killing is going to be a norm, it will be in your time, uh, how does this work? Well, we do no harm. We do no harm, exactly. I once spent a whole day debating Peter Singer in the University of Detroit, Wayne State. Peter Singer is the most infamous of the modern bioethicists who think that this is perfectly reasonable. And it is, but the question you usually have to ask about these things is when you demand this way of doing things or demand that this be called ethical, what are your assumptions that underlie that? Now, it is perfectly reasonable to kill people if, and only if, I think, there is no judgment after death. If this life is all you have, then you do what you want. And you don't even care about whether it has ramifications for other people. It will, because most old people uh, begin to feel that they're a burden. Now, years ago, most good doctors recognized when somebody says, I think I want to be killed, they don't mean that. We don't recognize laments anymore. When someone says, I feel worthless, I ought to be killed, what they're actually saying is, tell me that my life has meaning, that it hasn't been wasted. And they ought to have a family that could do that for them. So, depending upon how you see the world, 
you are going to come up with different ethical systems. If we are forced, as some of your political leaders certainly want, to say that religion has no place in the public square, as we currently know it, that will happen. But of course, religion will always have a place in the public square because the secularist believes that there is no God that matters. They can't prove that. What they're doing is substituting one religious base for another. As human beings, as Wittgenstein put it, ethics, faith, is a condition of man. We, if nothing can be assumed, nothing can be proved. There is no autonomous science without foundations. It would not have got started in the first place if people in the 12th and 13th centuries didn't say, under the surface chaos of life, there must be order because God is a God of order. You needed that belief to get going, as Professor Butterfield at Cambridge put it. If Newton had not had his God, he would not have gone looking for his laws. You see, most great science has no immediate application. So if you live a life of utilitarian means, you don't get to these big issues. A little story that you will remember will help cement this in place. You all know the name Niels Bohr of the quantum physics revolution. It was said that Niels Bohr came into a common room in a, I think it was the University of Manchester in the 1920s when quantum physics was being worked out. And he looked very happy. And a professor of English said, Niels, you look as though you had a great afternoon. And he said, I have. And he said, let me buy you a drink and you explain to me what I've done, what you've done. And he said, well, this afternoon I convinced myself that the atom is not the ultimate particle. It can be split. And the prof of English said, and what, pray, is the relevance of that? And Niels Bohr thought for a moment or two and then he said, fortunately, as far as I can see, none whatsoever. You see, if you reduce yourself to material events that you can currently understand, you really are reducing yourself in a very big way. Relevance is not an adequate activity for running a society. There are things you need much more. Let me close this bit with a wonderful, my favourite description of what it means to be a doctor. Written by a man whose name you will learn, but you probably won't learn much more about him, is Thomas Sydenham of Sydenham's career. And it goes like this. It becomes every man, you could say now, or woman, who gives himself to the care of others to seriously consider the four following things. First, that all your gifts and skills have been given to you. And as such, they should be used for the good of mankind and the glory of God. Secondly, that you should not be concerned about money. Thirdly, that you should consider that in order that we might understand the greatness, the sanctity of human life, the only begotten Son of God became himself a man, that we might see that clearly. And then fourthly, that since you are going to die, you should be tender in caring for your suffering patients because you're going the same way. He was the first man to use opium in an ordered fashion to deal with pain. Yet he gets very little credibility in the modern world. An amazing man. You've got to decide what your priorities are and you need to think them through carefully. And not to know any history is very bad because People have thought about these things more carefully in the past than they do now. You're overloaded with information, aren't you? You may not believe this, but 20 years ago I started teaching a biochemistry course with no requirement for memory. Because I realized your real problem was that you couldn't read. And I taught students how to read and deconstruct and reconstruct. And it worked. Eliot saw it coming in a poem called Choruses on the Rock, written in the 1930s. He said this, he was predicting us, he said, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Information is a medical student. Knowledge is a resident. Wisdom is what you want when you're dying. Hopefully there'll still be some around. Different stories will have a very different attitude to euthanasia. And what we have got to do is argue that we must provide hospitals that will not do killing as well as ones that will, as numbers warrant. It, a woman who has as much right to an obstetrician who doesn't kill babies on his day off, so to speak, as other women have a right to somebody who will kill babies. 
In fact, of course, killing patients and killing babies doesn't need more than six weeks training. We should separate it from medicine altogether uh, because it's not part of our tradition, it's not part of our history, and it would, keep it, it would keep medicine clean while we see what the consequences of this are. They've not been good before. The Jews were not the first to be killed. Disabled, homosexuals uh, came before them, and gypsies. We are logical but slowly. Once we start down a path, we push it to the point where we are horrified. We should protect our profession, if we can, from getting sucked into this. We are not required. It should be anybody but doctors. I propose lawyers should be trained to do the killing. Uh, it only takes six weeks, and they ought to be present. There ought also to be randomized controlled trials for new laws before they become permanent new laws. Yeah. Well, off you go to your afternoon's labour. <laughs>